Hello and welcome back. We are reading chapter 79 of The Life of Pi. The full text is available in a series of videos on the channel. The Life of Pi, Jan Martel, chapter 79. There were sharks every day, mainly makos and blue sharks, but also oceanic white chips and once a tiger shark straight from the blackest of nightmares. Dawn and dusk were their favorite times. They never seriously troubled us. On occasion, one knocked the hull of the lifeboat with his tail. I don't think it was accidental. Other marine life did it too, turtles and even dorados. I believe it was part of a shark's way of determining the nature of, this, of the lifeboat. A good whack on the offender's nose with the hatchet sent it vanishing post-haste into the deep. The main nuisance of sharks was that they made being in the water risky, like trespassing on a property where there's a sign saying beware of the dog. Otherwise, I grew quite fond of sharks. They were like curmudgeonly old friends who would never admit that they liked me yet came around to see me all the time. The blue sharks were smaller, usually no more than four or five feet long, and the most attractive, sleek and slender, with small mouths and discreet gill slits. Their backs were a rich ultramarine and their stomachs were snow white, colors that vanished to grey or black when they were at any depth, but which close to the surface sparkled with surprising brilliance. The makos were larger and had mouths bursting with frightening teeth, but they too were nicely colored, an indigo blue that shimmered beautifully in the sun. The oceanic white tips were often shorter than the makos, some of which stretched to 12 feet, but they were much stockier and had enormous dorsal fins that they sailed high above the surface of the water like a war banner, a rapidly moving sight that was always nerve-wracking to behold. Besides, they were a dull color, a sort of grayish brown and a mottled white tip of their fin held no special attraction. I caught a number of small sharks, uh, blue sharks for the most part, but some makos too. Each time it was just after sunset in the dying light of the day, and I caught them with my bare hands as they came close to the lifeboat. The first one was my largest, a mako uh, over four feet long. It had come and gone near the bow several times. As it was passing by yet again, I impulsively dropped my hand into the water and grabbed it just ahead of the tail, where its body was thinnest. Its harsh skin afforded such a marvelously good grip that without thinking about what I was doing, I pulled. As I pulled, it jumped, giving my arm a terrific shake. To my horror and delight, the thing bolted into the air in an explosion of water and spray, and for the merest fraction of a second, I didn't know what to do next. The thing was smaller than I, but wasn't, being, wasn't I being a foolhardy Goliath here? Shouldn't I let go? I turned and swung, and the thing fell on the, uh, falling on the tarpaulin. I threw the mako towards the stern. The fish fell from the sky into Richard Parker's territory. It landed with a crash and started thwacking about with such thunder that I was afraid it would demolish the boat. Richard Parker was startled. He attacked immediately. An epic battle began. Of interest to zoologists, I can report the following. A tiger will not at first attack a shark out of water with its jaws, but will rather strike at it with its four paws. Richard Parker started clubbing the shark. I shuddered at every blow. They were simply terrible. Just one delivered to a human would break every bone, would turn any piece of furniture into splinters, would reduce an entire house into a pile of rubble. That the makos was not enjoying the treatment was evident from the way it was twisting and turning and beating its tail and reaching with its mouth. Perhaps it was because Richard Parker was not familiar with sharks, he had never he never encountered a predatory fish. Whatever the case, it happened. An accident. One of those few times when I was reminded that Richard Parker was not perfect, that despite his honed instincts, he too can could bumble. He put his left paw into the uh, Mako's mouth. The Mako closed his jaws. Immediately, Richard Parker reared onto his back legs. The shark was jer jerked up, but it would not let go. Richard Parker fell back opened his mouth wide and full out roared. I felt a blast of hot air against my body. The air visibly shook like the heat coming up a road on a hot day. I can well imagine that somewhere far off, 150 miles away, a ship's watch looked up, startled, and later reported the oddest thing, that he thought he heard a cat's meow coming from three o'clock. Days later, that roar was still ringing in my gut, but a shark is deaf, conventionally speaking. So while I, who wouldn't think of pinching a tiger's paw, let alone of trying to swallow one, received a volcanic roar full in the face and quaked and trembled and turned liquid with fear and collapsed, the shark perceived only a dull vibration. 
Richard Parker turned and started clawing the shark's head with his free front paw and biting into it with his jaws, while the, his rear legs began tearing at its stomach and back. The shark held onto his paw, its only line of defense and attack, and thrashed its tail. Tiger and shark twisted and tumbled about. With great effort, I managed to gain enough control of my body to get onto the raft and release it. The lifeboat drifted away. I saw flashes of orange and deep blue, of fur and skin, as the lifeboat rocked from side to side. Richard Parker's snarly was simply terrifying. At last, the boat stopped moving. After several minutes, Richard Parker sat up, licking his left paw. In the following days, he spent much time tending his four paws. A shark skin is covered with minute uh, tubercles that make it as rough as sandpaper. He had no doubt cut himself while repeatedly raking the shark. His left paw was injured, but the damage did not seem permanent. No toes or claws were missing. As for the mako, except for the tips of the tail and the mouth area, incongruously untouched, it was a half-eaten butchered mess. Chunks of reddish grey flesh and clumps of internal organs were strewn about. I managed to gas some of the shark's remains, but to my disappointment, the vertebrae of sharks do not hold fluid. At least the flesh was tasty and unfishy, and the crunchiness of cartilage was a welcome respite from so much soft food. Subsequently, I went for smaller sharks, pups really, and I killed them myself. I found that stabbing them through the eyes with the knife was a faster, less tiresome way of killing them than hacking at the tops of their heads with the hatchet. Chapter 80 Of all the Dorados, I remember one in particular, a special Dorado. It was early morning on a cloudy day and we were in the midst of a storm of flying fish. Richard Parker was actively swatting at them. I was huddled behind a turtle shell, shielding myself from the flying fish. I had a gaff with a piece of net hanging from it, ten, uh, extending into the open. I was hoping to catch fish in this way, but I wasn't having much luck. A flying fish whizzed by. The Dorado that was chasing it burst out of the water. It was a bad calculation. The anxious flying fish got away, but... Miss, just missing my net, but the Dorado hit the gunnel like a cannonball. The thud it made shook the whole boat. A spurt of blood sprang the tarpaulin. I reacted quickly. I dropped beneath the hail of flying fish and reached for the Dorado just ahead of a shark. I pulled it aboard. It was dead, or nearly there, and turning all kinds of colours. What a catch! What a catch! I thought excitedly. Thanks be to you, Jesus, Matya! A fish was fat and fleshy. It must have weighed a good 40 pounds. It would feed a horde. Its eyes and spine would irrigate a desert. Alas, Richard Parker's great head had turned my way. I sensed it from the corner of my eyes. The flying fish was still coming, but he was no longer interested in them. It was the fish in my hand that was now the focus of his attention. He was eight feet away. His mouth was half open. A fish wing dangling from it. His back became rounder. His rump wiggled. His tail twitched, it twitched. It was clear. He was in a crouch and he was ready to attack me. It was too late to get away, too late even to blow my whistle. My time had come. But enough was enough. I had suffered so much. I was so hungry. There were only so many days you could go without eating. And so, in a moment of insanity, brought on by hunger because I was more set on eating than I was on staying alive, without any means of defense, naked in every sense of the term, I looked Richard Parker dead in the eyes. Suddenly, his brute strength meant only a moral weakness. It was nothing compared to the strength in my mind. I stared into his eyes, wide-eyed and defiant, and we faced off. Any zookeeper will tell you that a tiger, indeed any cat, will not attack in the face of a direct stare, but will wait until the deer or antelope or wild ox had turned its eyes. But to know that and to apply it are two very different things, and it's a useless bit of knowledge if you're hoping to stare down a gregarious wild cat. While you hold one lion in the thrall of your gaze, another will come up to you from behind. For two, perhaps three seconds, a terrified battle of minds for status and authority was waged between a boy and a tiger. He needed to make only the shortest of lunges to be on top of me, but I held my stare. Richard Parker licked his nose, groaned and turned away. He angrily battered a flying fish. I had won. I gasped with disbelief, heaved the Dorado onto my hands into my hands and hurried away to the raft. Shortly thereafter, I delivered to Richard Parker a fair chunk of the flesh. 
From that day onward, I felt my mastery was no longer in question, and I began to spend progressively more time on the lifeboat. First at the bow, then as I gained confidence on the more comfortable tarpaulin. I was still scared of Richard Parker, but only when it was necessary. His simple presence no longer strained me. You can get used to anything, haven't I already said that? Isn't that what all survivors say? Initially, I lay on the top with my head against its rolled up bow edge. It was raised a little since the ends of the lifeboat were higher than its middle and so I could keep an eye on Richard Parker. Later on, I turned the other way with my head resting just above the middle bench, my back to Richard Parker and his territory. In this position, I was further away from the edges of the boat and less exposed to wind and spray. Okay, that was chapter 80. Stay tuned for chapter 81.